Christ your son by his offering, by his sacrifice, O oh Lord. You have given unto us, Lord God, salvation. O oh Lord God, we thank you for eternal life which has been imparted, O oh Lord God, into our spirit, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for every opportunity that we have to hear your word. Every opportunity we have, O oh Lord, to read and to study your word, to meditate upon your word. We thank you this morning, O oh Lord, that your word, that your word, O oh God, is full of the treasures, O oh Lord God, which nothing in this world can compare to, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, O oh God, for the truth of your word which sets free, O oh God. For you have declared, O oh Lord God, that we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free, O oh God. I pray this morning, O oh Lord God, that your word will come forth with power, with Lord God, with precision in the name of Jesus. I pray that your word will find a resting place, O oh Lord, in the hearts of men and women, young and old. Lord God, all those in this place, those that are joining us via whatever platform, Father. I pray that your word, O oh Lord, will find an entrance, O oh Lord God, into the hearts, O oh Lord, into the hearts of your people, O oh Lord. I thank you, Lord, that there will be a change and transformation that is brought about, Lord, by your word. Every, Lord God, opportunity that we have to hear your word is an opportunity for change. It's an opportunity, Lord God, for, for deliverance. It's an opportunity, Lord God, for breakthrough. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that this morning there's a breaking forth, O oh Lord God. There's a breaking through for the people of God in Jesus' name. We give you thanks and we give you praise and glory and honor and we give you all the worship, O oh Lord God. I yield myself, O oh Lord, to the authority of the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you will work through me this morning, that you will speak to us this morning, O oh God. Without your Spirit, O oh God, what can we do, Father God? It is your Spirit who helps us, who leads us, who guides us, who teaches us. It is your Spirit, O oh God, who connects us with you this morning. We thank you this morning, O oh Lord, for the ministry of angels. Thank you that the angels of the Lord encamp about us, O oh God. I thank you this morning that the prayers of your people will ascend, O oh Lord God. And I thank you that the angels of God will descend with answers to the prayers of Jesus. Unto Jesus Christ and Christ alone be all praise, glory, honor, and worship. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Oh Lord of oh God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Because of the blood, oh Lord, we are in a new and a better covenant, oh God. Because of the blood, oh Lord God, we have a way of entrance into the most holy place, oh God. Because of the blood, oh Lord God, you see us, Lord God, not in our own, but you see us, oh Lord God, through the lens of the blood, oh Father God. You see us this morning washed, oh Lord, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb of God, Christ Jesus. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We give you praise, glory, and honor, and we give you all the worship this morning, oh God. Jesus, magnificent name, and all the people of God say, Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Somebody shout, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, you can do better than that.
understand that we have eternal life. And God has given you His eternal word. I see, that's why you can't just live your life as a Christian. You come to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you stop there. You've got to continue. And what God has imparted to your spirit, that life that he has imparted to your spirit, you need to feel it. You need to feel it. In other words, you need to add fire to it. And how do you do that? You do that through fellowship with his word and his spirit. See, that life was there. It's there. And for it to manifest, for it to burst forth into your natural, you need to feed it with the word of God. Because remember, you have eternal life. Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirits and they are life. Spirit is pneuma. The Greek for spirit is pneuma. In other words, wind. His words are wind and they are life. So many life as God has. And when you can have fellowship with His word, you allow the very spirit who wrote this word. This word was not written by mere human beings. It was the spirit of God, God Himself who inspired holy men of old to put pen to paper so that God's word will be right here with us. But now you need that word to abide on the inside of you. And once you receive that word, the wind that is in the word will blow you into the right direction. It will catapult you. If you're sick, it will catapult you from sickness to healing. It will catapult you. It will change everything about you. You see, the life that you're living in the natural, yes, we are in the natural. But you must understand that we are supernatural people. We belong to a supernatural class because we serve a supernatural God who has given us the supernatural word. Talk to me, somebody. But it's only when this word is alive on the inside of you that this word can change your natural to supernatural. I think as the church, and when I say the church, I'm speaking about the body of Christ. This building is not the church. We collectively are the church. You and I together are the church. You know there are people that sit at home and think, okay, I am the church. I don't need to go and assemble in the church building. It's just a building because I am the church. Let me tell you, if you're supposed to be the eye for this body, that means you are blind because an eye cannot function on its own. Talk to me, somebody. It means that you may be a hand, but because you're sitting in the comfort of your home, the body is incomplete. That's why Jesus, come on, talk to me, somebody. When you study the life of Jesus, throughout the gospel, you find that Jesus was in the temple, as was his custom. And then you find the writer of Hebrews says, do not neglect the gathering of the saints, because when we come together, this is a glorious body. Talk to me, somebody. Somebody here is an eye. Somebody here is an ear. Somebody here is a hand. Somebody here is an arm. Somebody here is a leg. Talk to me, somebody. We put together, make up the body. All of us put together make up the body. The church has been robbed. We think, okay, church is just about coming into a building and we sing a few nice hymns. I 
and then we just listen to the scripture and then we go home. That is not church, church. That is not church. If you're going to study revivals that happen in the body of Christ, study the Zusa Street revival. If you study what happened, listen, if you're going to read and you research what happened there, people that were sick, when they just stepped into the building, they were healed. someone who's sick, Lord, if it's your will, please would you heal, brother? So, hey, it is his will. The Bible says it. By his stripes you were healed. What more do you want? It is his will that you be healed. It is his will. Come on, somebody. Say, I serve a supernatural God. I believe in the supernatural. Hallelujah. That's one thing that's evident about the, God's nature. Last week I, I ministered to you on having the right perception of God. Your perception of God. How you perceive God. And when you read the Bible from Genesis through to Revelation, you find one thing is evident about his nature. He is supernatural in nature. Supernatural in being. Nobody created him. Oh, Jesus. Nobody created him. 
He's the one who's always existed. He is life. He is life. He doesn't need a life source. He is life. He is light. Hallelujah. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 15, the parable of the lost coin. Now, <clears throat> we know the parable of the lost sheep, the one of the lost coin, and the lost son. It's got to do with salvation. It's got to do with God's desire for all mankind to be saved. God's call unto repentance. Now, I was reading this this week and <clears throat> I kind of saw another dimension to this. Because in Luke's Gospel chapter 19, we find that Jesus 
goes to the house of a man who was a tax collector, a man who was despised by the people of his day, a man by the name of Zacchaeus. You all know the account of Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19. And then we find how Jesus visits him. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, whilst he's in the tree, come down for today I need to dine in your house. I must come to your house. Zacchaeus comes down the tree and goes to his home. One of the things that Jesus says unto Zacchaeus, surely while Jesus was there, he was speaking unto Zacchaeus and all who were there, which prompted a repentant heart in Zacchaeus, that he, all of a sudden, he says, look, Lord, if I've robbed anybody or cheated anybody, I'm going to give them, you know, I'm, I'm returning, I'm making restitution. But what caught my attention was verse 10 of Luke 19. Where Jesus says the Son of Man came to seek, came to seek out and to save that which was lost. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And it brought me to the conclusion that every individual that has been born into the fall of Adam, has lost something. Hallelujah. Every individual has lost something. That's why you find today many people are trying to make a living and trying to do better in life. Because they understand that there's something greater to their life than what there is. Now Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. So that which man lost to the enemy, Jesus came to win it back for us. Come on somebody, I think I'm in the wrong place. That which the enemy has had robbed us of, Christ came to win it back for us. Now we find in Luke 15, verse number 8, Jesus says, Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? This woman is so diligent, she wants to find it. Because she knows without that one, what she has is incomplete. Now verse 9, when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. This brings me to the point of 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Paul writing to Timothy and he says to you and I this morning, Be diligent. You see this woman who lost the coin, she was diligent in her seeking. She put the light on and she started to move things around because she was looking for that coin. I mean, how many of you, how many of you have ever misplaced anything in your life? Am I, am I the only one? You've ever misplaced, some have never misplaced anything. Praise God, bless you. You understand You've misplaced. When you've misplaced something, you'll turn the house upside down to find it. I found that, you know, sometimes you'll even, man, you'll even turn the sofas in the lounge, in the living room, you'll turn them upside down just to make sure. And then you, you know, you look, you lift up the mattress, lift up the bed, and you go, if it's somewhere in the wardrobe, you take out everything. And take note. Whilst you're doing that, you have no, you know, the fact of this thought. This thought never passes or crosses your mind 
that I'm wasting my time. You know? But never crosses your mind to say, I'm looking for this thing. Time can go. If it takes you the whole day to look for it, you go search for it the whole day. Now this woman was diligent. Now Paul writes to Timothy and he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. Rightly dividing the truth. Another translation says, study. Study to show yourself. Study. What's he talking about? He's talking about the study of his word, of God's word. What Paul is saying here to Timothy, be diligent concerning the word of God. Be diligent. You know, you can't read the word today, or rather you can't hear it today. And when you get home today after service, you go and put your Bible somewhere and come next week, Sunday, you go look for your Bible. Oh, where's my Bible? I'm going to church. I can't go to church without my Bible. And then when you do find it, you lost it. So no one can see it. It's unused. You see, there are those who allow the word to gather dust. But then there are those who go home. And look and say, oh, what was the Lord saying in this morning's service? Let me go and add on to it. Monday you add, Tuesday you add, Wednesday you add. So you are building your life. You are building your life. That, that is diligence. That is diligence. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, Paul says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, profitable for doctrine, profitable for teaching. God will teach you through his word. Hallelujah. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. The word of God will discipline you. The word of God will direct you. For instruction in righteousness. If you really want to know how you ought to live your life, the word of God will show you. Doesn't end there. He says this, that the man of God is talking about you and I. You and I, saints of God, beloved of God, may be complete you understand it? This word is profitable. You will profit by this word. And as you profit by what this word reveals, how this word teaches you, how this word disciplines you, how this word corrects you, how this word instructs you, you'll find, you'll get to a point where you are complete, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, not just equipped, you can equip someone. You can equip someone. I can give someone. You know, ever heard the saying, uh, give a man a fish, he'll always ask you for a fish. Give him a rod, and he'll fish for himself. Giving him the rod will not cause him to be successful at fishing for himself. Because what you've done, you've just equipped him. What use is it? If he's got the rod and the bait is there, but he doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to, how to <coughs> attach the sinker to the line. He doesn't know how to fasten the hook to the line. He doesn't know how to apply the bait to the hook. <coughs> he probably doesn't know about What's that thing they call it? The bomb. Hey, I went fishing with Brother Vin once and he showed me. I, don't, I can't remember the exact thing, but they call it a bomb, some bomb. You put bait in it and you put it on that line. So he won't know about that. And he also won't know how to cut. 
house. You got, there's a special way. I always thought you took the rod and you just. Brother, he said, no, Pastor, this is how you do it. You understand? There's a way. You've got to cast it. Now, once you've shown him all that, then you've thoroughly equipped him. You can't just give him and say, look, it's like giving someone, or your children for that matter, your children for that matter, always asking you, I need spending, I need spending, I need spending. And then half the time you say, you think money grows on trees? A mistake I made was once when I told my children, I said that, hey, you know, money is made from paper and papers from the tree. And I said, do you think money grows on trees? And they said, but remember what you said. <laughs> but here's the matter. They ask you for spending, you give them spending. They'll always ask you for spending if you don't teach them to save and invest. Because you can give the child, you can give them the money. The child will squander the money. He doesn't know how to handle the money. But if you teach him to take that money and invest it and make how money works for you and not you for money, that's the difference. When you teach them how to make their money work for them, then they'll be independent of coming to ask you for money for them. Come on, somebody. Amen. I've seen some times where we get a notice from the school as an event, and I'll go to the boys and I'll say, Okay, how much do you need? Say, no, don't worry, Dad, I got money. Where do you got money from? No, I'm saying. You, you get what I'm saying? So, that is being thoroughly equipped. Thoroughly equipped means you're given the tools for the job and the skill as well. You with me? So that's what Paul is saying here. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. For every good work. Hallelujah. Now, my foundational text is the woman with that coin. She lost the coin. And how, having found the coin, she rejoices and calls her neighbors and says, Look, this coin which I lost, I found. I would like to liken that to an individual who finds their purpose. An individual who finds... That, that coin that I'm talking about this morning is your identity and your purpose. Because if you don't know who you are, you'll never know your purpose in life. If you don't know who you are, you'll never understand what you can achieve in life. Hence, you need to seek out your identity and look for opportunity. Talk to me, somebody. How many of you know a man by the name of Sir Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton. You've ever heard of Isaac Newton? Many of you have heard of him in school primary school or secondary school. But you've heard of Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was an English mathematician, a physicist, an astronomer, a theologian, and an author. And we find that he He did something. He made a discovery. He discovered the law of gravity. The law of motion, which has become the basis in physics. He even discovered something in mathematics which we do to this very day called calculus. Hence, there was a man by the name of Albert Einstein. How many of you have heard of Albert Einstein? You ever heard of Einstein? It's not a sin if you know him, if you've heard of him. Okay? You've heard of him. 
heard of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is quoted as saying once that Isaac Newton is one of the smartest men he's ever come to know. But you find many times when people think of Einstein, they think of somebody great. But look at that remark from Einstein. That though he was great, he never considered himself to be better than Newton. He says Newton was one of the smartest people I've ever come to know. And when you look at the life of Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton was a devout Christian. Take note, I said devout Christian. He wasn't just a Christian. He was a devout Christian. He was devoted to his Christian faith. He was devoted to it. In fact, he was so devoted that that character trait, it actually played out in his life. He devoted himself to scripture. He devoted himself to his faith in Christ. That we find in his line of work, he was devoted to. They say whenever there was a social gathering or a party, he'd be invited and people would look for him. They'd look everywhere and they won't see him until they look underneath the tables. And when they look underneath the tables, he was there with papers. A whole lot of papers was invited. That's how devoted he was. He spent his days devoted to his work, writing. And it was through that devotion that he made tremendous discoveries. You see, many times God is calling us deeper in our relationship with him. And yet you find, you find, to this very day, you find that, you know, Christian folk, believers, we come to church, we are Christians. But in your daily life, you don't practice it. You're like so devoted to the church, but you're not devoted in your workplace. You give your workplace half. You give up. You do everything half-heartedly. So if you're doing it half-heartedly, it means that your, your faith, your spiritual life, is also being dealt with half-heartedly. Because whatever happens in the natural is happening in the spiritual. Newton was a devoted Christian. He, was, he practiced it out. Hallelujah. He practiced it out. That's why you find even someone like Einstein, could see something in this man to have called him somebody smart. It was the character trait of humility. I mean, consider this. Newton was probably a very well-known man in his day. Probably very well-known. And being invited to the party, he probably won, you, you, you know, somebody who's well-known I'm yet to find him at the party sitting right in the back. No, they go look for the, you know, I'm here. They must know I'm here. If they don't know, I'll talk loud so they know. If they don't hear, I'll laugh loud so they can hear the echoes I am here. Hallelujah. But Newton was not like that. Newton took his work went underneath the tables and he spent time under the table writing his notes writing he spent time writing spent time he was diligent that's the word to use he was a diligent individual hence in our lives too we've got to be diligent amen <laughs> hallelujah and he has found always Scrapping on a piece of paper, scrapping in a note, scrapping along. And we find that throughout history, there are many accounts of men and women 
who made great discoveries that have revolutionized the lives of humanity. In other words, this marked remarkable turns in human development. Amen. But the discovery, the pro discovery is a process. Discovery is a process. Say that with me. Discovery is a process. It's a process because discovery takes time. You see, Joseph had a dream. God gave him a dream. And he had that dream. He shared it with his brothers. Not everybody is going to celebrate your dream or your vision. Come and talk to me. Because surely at the end, Joseph must have said, hey, I should never, ever have told it because look where I am today. But we find that that dream, for that dream to come to pass, Joseph had to undergo a process. So, discovering what the, the meaning of that dream was, was a process. Discovering what the meaning of your life is, is a process. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Talk to me some. Tell your neighbor it's not going to happen overnight. There's no microwave that can make this thing snap. Come and talk to me. Amen. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. Amen. Now, even so, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, even so, it is the same with devotion to the Word of God. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. When you devote yourself to the study of God's Word to make discovery. You see, remember I told you about that woman that found that coin. was lost. Many people today, you find people are searching for their missing coins in life. Many people are searching for their missing coins. And you find that you now, you have a wonderful opportunity. You have the Word of God. I mean, when you study the Word of God, the Word of God, it's a discovery of who God is. You discover who He is. Who this great God is. God who has no beginning, no end. A God who is life himself. An all-powerful God. An omnipotent God. An omniscient God. A God who is all-knowing. That when you study the word, you say, oh, My word, this is speaking to me. This is me. This is me. I once, you know, I used to read, you know, read and read and read it, until one day I was reading um, the account of Israel in Egypt. And I was reading and I, I think I was like a year or so in the same. And I always read it, you know, what an account and God really is doing. Until one day as I was reading it, the Holy Spirit stopped me there in my tracks. Holy Spirit said, look at Pharaoh. Can you see yourself in Pharaoh? See, that's how the word of God will, will deal with you. That you can see yourself. Everybody knows what oh, Pharaoh was like. And sometimes, if you can just stop and see, am I like that? The, the word will change you. The word will transform you. As you study, you start discovering who God is. And then you start discovering who he created you to be. You discover why you've been created. You discover your purpose. Hallelujah. You discover your purpose. And then you discover what God has given to you. Most importantly, when you come and talk to me, somebody, when you read the Gospels and you go through the New Testament or the Epistles, you find that, man, I don't need to work for it. It's already been done. God has given to me freely by grace. It's no longer the old way you had to work for it. It's the new way I don't deserve it. But 
But God, because of his mercy, because of his love, because of the blood which his son shed for me, because of that, by his grace I am saved. By his grace I am healed. By his grace I am delivered. By his grace I am set free. By his grace I am no longer the same. Hallelujah. You discover all that God has given to you freely. By his grace. You discover how much God has empowered you. You discover that, hey, I don't need to be running from serpents and scorpions and looking for something to cover them with. I just trample them under the underfoot. Hallelujah. I learned that, hey, I don't need to fight an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I learned that, hey, just keep quiet like Jesus and turn the other cheek. I learned that, hey, when you hate it, you keep loving. You don't hate back. You know, many times I found that through counseling people and speaking to people, people are always concerned about how many people hate them, how many people don't like them. And how many, it's just hate, 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 hate. Hey, listen. If you are expecting a hater to love, they never gonna love. Because by nature, he's a hater. You can't expect him to love. You gotta pray for him to love. That's how we learn these things. You learn that. Your wrestle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities. You're not dealing with a person, but you're dealing with a personality. And you learn how to deal with it. How? Through the Word. It's only by studying the Word that you get to know these things. By studying the Word, by spending time with the Word. By spending time with the Word, you discover who you are. I mean, you, just stop for one second and ask yourself the first time you got saved when you would open your Bible and you read your Bible and God speaks to your heart. What did you do? What did you do? The first time you got saved and you read that word, what did you do? I guarantee you, you took that word you were so excited about it. You couldn't wait to share it with somebody. Hallelujah. You couldn't even wait. You couldn't even, some of you, you couldn't wait to get to church to tell somebody what God, what God told me this week. You know what God showed me in his word this week. You don't get that these days. You don't get that. Because nobody's spending time studying the word. Because it's through the word of God that you make discovery. Say amen to that. Jesus came to seek out and to save that which was lost. Hallelujah. It is God's will and God's desire that you live an abundant life with nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. That is God's will and God's plan for your life. To put it this way. This is God's gift to you and I. This is God's gift, his gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's through the study of the word, the hearing of the word, I understand that it is through believing in Jesus that I am saved. Not by my own works. He took my place. He became the substitute. He took my place. And now God has given us. He's given us his son. And 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was God. And you understand this son that was crucified. He is the word of God. God has given us his word. And now you have now the written word, the graphic word. 
the written word. And it's through studying the written word that you, that you start receiving a lover's word. A lover's word, it's a personified word. It's a word that, that gives you another personality. Come on, somebody. You understand? You, where you were once upon a time, you were a weakling. And things happened in your life. And you ran for Auntie Susie, Uncle Joe, and you ran to everybody trying to look for help. And everybody looked at you and said, oh, this pitiful little thing. Now you study the word for yourself and you say, hey, I am who the word of God says I am. I have what the word of God says I have. I can do what the word of God says I can do. Now you start, you start receiving this new nature that God desires you to have. Now you have... That's the logos. It, 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 it becomes a nature to you. It becomes second nature. It's nature. That becomes your habitat. And once it becomes your habitat, now you start operating by what is called Rima. Rima is a spoken word. That now you're not speaking now what your circumstance is speaking. You're speaking what God is speaking. Because it must abide with him. Jesus says, he who believes in me, from deep within his being shall what? Shall flow what? Rivers of living waters. Rivers of living waters. The word. Hallelujah. That you're no longer speaking about your circumstances. I told you last week. When situations, trouble troubles you, don't run. You travel, travel. When a challenge comes your way, you ought to get so excited and say, Ooh, I feel sorry for you. You come to the wrong address. But anyway, I'd like to introduce you to my God. Come on, somebody. Because the enemy is trying to introduce fear to you. He's trying to introduce doubt to you. He's trying to introduce disbelief to you. You say, uh-uh, that's not my package. You know, it's like when you receive a letter. Okay, nowadays, they have emails, so we have less of those. But I remember back in the day, you'd go to the post box, and then you'd get a letter. I remember as a child, it was, it was my duty. I loved it so much. She's going to get the post at the post box. I remember there were two of my friends. We used to go, all three of us, we used to walk, we used to stay in Fairley at the houses and the post box was there with the flats. And we'd walk, all three of us, every afternoon. we go and we walk and we got open the post box. Our post boxes were kind of close together. we check. And sometimes we even compare them. Say, how many letters you got? They say, ah, you all got more. And then, and then sometimes, you know, you got like a bigger one. Say, ah, we got less, but see, we got a big envelope, you got a small envelope. Well, ours is nice, but nice colors. Yours doesn't have nice colors. Ours is nice and thick, yours, you know. But little did we know that they were both. <laughs> <laughs> but we were comparing nonetheless. But it was something that was nice, and you got home sometimes. Or even when your parents got back from work, they asked you, did you check the post today? You understand? If you didn't, then you made a plan quickly, go to post. But, and then, there were times to get to the post box and you wouldn't check. And then all of a sudden now, you know, you, you got wiser through school. And now you could read. So you thought, hey, this surname is not our surname. And then sometimes, you know, you want to see what's in this because it's not our sermon. Okay? And then they would tell me about turning the kettle on and you let the steam go. Just so you can see. Inquisitive. And then, whilst you're still busy and the kettle, you know, the mistake they made was making that little kettle. Because when it starts whistling, 
Then the parents think, oh, someone's making tea. And in our house, whenever they heard, it was one of two things. Either they shouted from somewhere in the house, make for me too. <laughs> or they came to see who's making tea. And then they came to see who's making tea and they, what you doing? And then you got a honeymoon because it wasn't addressed to you. You see that? It wasn't, it wasn't addressed to you. So we were taught, if it's not for us, you write on it RTS. And when you go to the post box, there's a little red post box where you can put it in there. And the, they would go back to the post office and they would turn it to sin. The same way, ladies and gentlemen, God has sent forth his word to you and I. You should look forward to every opportunity that you have to open the word to see what God has to say. In the very same way, you were so excited to see what Edgar was selling, was sending you to see what's in new specials. You were so excited, you couldn't wait. When they said 50% off or 75, I guarantee you now, if you were to open your email or get a letter in your post box or in your gate this morning that said 90% off, I guarantee you tomorrow morning, even before you go to work, some of you will find you, you would have so much creativity just to make it for that 90% off. I guarantee you, you do it. Because, man, where can you get that? And you get people, where can you get that these days? How about you demonstrating that same attitude when it comes to the word of God? That I can't wait to hear what God has to say about my circumstances. I can't wait to hear what God has to say about tomorrow. I can't wait to hear what God has to say about next week. Listen, when, when you start studying the word of God, you want, there'll be no need to buy the newspaper because the Bible already gives you tomorrow's news. I come and talk to me, somebody. When they tell you, who oh, did you read the paper today? They say, hey, brother, I read it yesterday. How? Oh, you got the paper yesterday? Yes, it's called a B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Hallelujah. That's the discoveries you make in the word of God. You start discovering the course that your life should take. That if your life is, listen, if your life is going the wrong way, you can go to the word of God. God's word will redirect your steps. It will redirect your steps. When you can't see a way out, God's word will show you a way out. God's word will give you something to hope for. God's word will give you something that you can hold on to. With all the negativity and everything that's happening around you, the word of God will give you faith. Faith to believe that it can happen now. It will give you hope to believe that next year is going to be a better year. The word of God will do that for you. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. You see, it's through the word, through the light of the word of God that we can recover our lost point. Because if something is lost, you can't look for it in the dark. Hello? Ever had no children in your house? South Africa is the only country in the world where you pay for something and they try to ask you, please don't use it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, we celebrate our uniqueness in South Africa. <laughs> but when you have load shedding and you've got to look for something, okay, it's difficult to find. But if the lights are on, I can see it. Now it's through the light of God's word that you'll find your lost point. Each one of you here this morning, I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. 
I don't care what upbringing you had. I don't care what past you had. Each one of you is unique unto God. And each one of you has a coin that you need to discover. You have an identity that you need to discover. And that identity is in Jesus. That identity is in Christ. Because once you find that identity, things that you've never done in your life, things that you could never do, things that were impossible for you to do, all of a sudden, because of the study of the graphing, you have a logos that has changed. Now you start declaring the rhema. Now you start saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ, translated directly from the Greek, means the anointed one and his anointing. The anointing breaks yokes. It destroys yokes. It lifts burdens. You find that because of the anointed one and his anointing, things you couldn't do before, all of a sudden you can do. You become like Samson who was a skinny man. You begin to take out gates of cities that you were supposed to enter in, but you couldn't come out. It's because of the anointed one and his anointing. The anointing is a divine enablement, a divine empowerment from God to do that which is humanly impossible because now you are not doing it in your own strength. You are not doing it in the natural. You are doing it in the supernatural. You are doing it in God, somebody. You are doing it in God. That's why you say in Him I move, in Him I love, in Him I breathe, in Him I have my being, in Him I have my existence. But you've got to be in the Word to discover this. You've got a lost point, an identity. Did you know, Kandi, there are things that you can achieve that you haven't even yet thought of? You haven't thought of yet. No, the Misa, did you know that? There are things you can do. The Misa, there's things you can do. Shalom, there's things you can do that you haven't even thought of, Adelaide. Things that you've never thought of. Father, you can do, you can achieve them.
is a God of more than enough, Alicia. He said, I am El Shaddai, the many-breasted one. I am the great I am. I'll be whatever you want me to be. You want me to be your healer, I'll heal you. The thing is, what do you want him to be? What do you want him to be? He'll be everything you want him to be. Hallelujah. scripture now. I am the Lord thy God. Is there anything too difficult for me? Now my question to you. Is there anything too difficult for God? Ask your neighbor. Is there anything too difficult for God? Now some of you don't know, ask your neighbor. Ask your neighbor, is there anything too difficult for God? Did your neighbor respond? How many of you did the neighbor respond with this? What did the neighbor say? Nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing, absolutely nothing is too difficult for God. Hallelujah. Nothing. There's nothing too difficult for God. My question now is, where does God reside? Where does He reside? Where does He live? Where does He live? Where does He live? Someone is saying something in here. <laughs> it's all over. It's all over.
according to the word. That we find we lose a lot in this life. Everything. Absolutely everything. Everything small, minute, everything. Even if you need a microscope for it. And everything great concerning your life. Small thing. You see, God has given you His Word. That's His gift to you, His Word. It's like a man of God said everything you desire in your life is wrapped up in the Word of God. Now, what do you wrap? The gift. But unless you unwrap the gift, You'll never know what is the gift. If someone buys you a gift, how many of you? Someone bought you a gift, wedding gifts, birthday gifts, whatever gift. They bought it, it came wrapped to you. You've still got it to this very day. It's still wrapped. So it is with the word of God. If you don't open it, if you don't read it for yourself, if you don't study it for yourself, you'll never know what you have. You'll never know what you're capable of. You'll never know what you can achieve. Some of you, by opening the word of God from today, will save data. <laughs> Praise God, I came to church. Pastor gave me a saving tip. How to save data. You know why? You're going to search for that missing form yourself. And you're going to make a discovery. Because you don't have Google, you've got a God. Some of you, every problem you've got, Google. Google. Now I'm saving you data. You're not going to Google even a God. Come on, somebody. You're not going to Google even a oh, oh, God. All your problems, you're sending them to heaven. Come and say this from today. Discovery is a process. Discovery who that man is or who that woman is, it's a process. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Because listen, when, you, when you're reading, God, you know, the Holy Spirit will start to tell you now which type of man you need. And you start, you know, you start praying about that specific man with the Holy Spirit with you. You all just pray, oh Lord, please send me a man. God says, yes, there are many men in the world. Which one do you want? Hello? There are many men in the world. Which one do you want? I can give you one that's got biceps and triceps. He's going to use as a punching bag. Come on, 
comments on my life. What I'm just saying is that, you know, God is concerned about every minute detail of your life. You pray to God for a bicycle or a car or anything. God's asking what color, what name, what model. You understand? Be specific. See, because this is, this is what you discover in this world. Delight yourself in the Lord your God, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that amazing? That Lord, that's how God wants to relate with you. You see, things that you're hoping for, dreaming for, God, long before you even pray about them, you'll find God's already giving them to you. That's what I'm talking about. Your life is a journey of discovery. You have something yet to discover that will benefit humanity. I mean, we all, I told you about Isaac Newton. Some say, oh, man, what an intelligent man. But hey, God created him. God created you. And there's no partiality with God. What he did for one, he'll do for the other. If God did it, do it for Isaac, he'll do it for him. Simple as that. For some, unfortunately, Newton's discoveries became a headache because we had to study them. How would you like to be somebody's headache in 50 years now? Discover something. Come and discover something. Call to me and I will answer. I'll show you secrets. I'll show you secret things. I'll give you the treasures hidden in secret places, he says. I mean, how did the beer's mind stop? Somebody dug somewhere. Come on, Leroy. Don't you think that God can be the same Leroy? You know, I'm just going to dig right there. As you dig there, there's water coming out here. Wow, spring water. Did you ever think in your life you pay for water? You pay for drinking water. Nowadays, people don't even want to use the municipality water. They'd rather go to the water shop and complain for the water there. God can show you where that water is, the spring God can show you where the oil is. God can show you where the gold is. Because he put it there. You understand? So how about you making a discovery? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, if you ever thought your life is boring, you know, maybe you didn't like history, but I love reading. And history, history is kind of interesting. I don't need to read in school, but... I also enjoy reading with some historical things. Why we consider Vasco da Gama or Christopher Columbus, all these guys, they were explorers. How about you becoming an explorer by exploring the Word of God and seeing who God really created you to be and seeing that life, the life you see, it's not really the life that God intends you to have. But when you read this word, God will reveal it to you. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm on the road to recovery. Hallelujah. I'm going to receive revelation. Well, today I receive revelation. See, because revelation is what births revolution. Revelation births revolution. And it's discovery that 
Thank you that you have so much in store for us, O oh Lord. It's all revealed in your word. It's all in your precious word. Thank you that we don't even need to worry about tomorrow. We don't need to worry about the future because it's secure in you. And because of your word, we see our future bright. We see it shining with your glory. We see your goodness, your love, and your mercy. Revealed unto us, O oh God. In your word, Father God, we see your thoughts towards us. Thoughts of peace, O oh God. Your thoughts towards us are innumerable, O oh God. Full of good things. So thank you this morning, O oh Lord God, that we can look to you always. Thank you for sending us your word, for giving us your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Who, Lord God, inscribed that word, who wrote that word. And it's the same Spirit, O oh Lord God, who inscribes your word in the tablets of our hearts. It's that self same Spirit, O oh Lord, which raised up Christ Jesus from the dead, which dwells within us, O oh Lord. It is He who quickens our mortal bodies. It is your Spirit, O oh Lord God, who gives us life gives us understanding. From today, O oh Lord, I pray that revelation will come to each and every individual in this place, those watching us by whatever platform, Father. I pray that revelation will come so that as revelation comes, O oh Lord, that it will revolutionize their lives, O oh Father God. Great Lord of God, and people will make great discoveries in your word. All the treasures of God that you've wrapped up in your word. They will receive them, O oh Lord, with deepness of heart and gladness, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. O oh God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the worship. Now, O oh Lord God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide in each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, may the Lord God Almighty grant you great success, grant you the sure mercies of his servant David, and may the Lord God grant you Peace, shalom peace, is all surpassing peace, which passes all understanding. That self same peace will guard your heart, will guard your mind, guard everything about you. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, Amen.